So this lecture is the last part of section 8.3 from your textbook, and we left off talking about the light-dependent reactions. So in the light-dependent reaction, again, it's occurring in the thylakoid, which is located inside a chloroplast, and the thylakoid is surrounded by stroma, which is outside of it, and the inside has like a fluid as well, but it's like a sac. And after um, the light energy from the sun is converted by the photosystems into high energy electrons, we have this buildup of hydrogen protons within the thylakoid membrane. So again, this think of this as a sac, and this is the inside of it. And so we get this high concentration of hydrogen protons. And as you guys remember from diffusion, things want to flow from a high concentration to the low outside of the thylakoid. And so in order to do that with a charged particle, we need a protein channel. And so we use ATP synthase, which is a special protein that actually allows the hydrogen protons to pass through. And then while it's passing, it actually spins. And that energy from that spinning motion and the passage of the protons through here allows us to add a phosphate group to an ADP molecule. So remember again, we've got like tight coils of a spring attaching these phosphates, um, the three phosphates in an ATP. And so in order to put on that third one onto an ADP molecule, you have to use a lot of energy. And so that energy comes from this buildup of protons here and this ATP synthase. So, in summary, the light-dependent reactions use water, ADP, NADP, and light. And what they produce is oxygen, ATP, and NADPH. And these compounds are what provide the energy to build energy-containing sugars in the next part of photosynthesis. And then the oxygen is, of course, what we breathe. So the next part of photosynthesis is occurring outside of the thylakoid in the stroma of the chloroplast. In the Kelvin cycle, ATP and NADPH, which were formed in that light-dependent reaction, contain a lot of chemical energy, but they're not stable molecules, so they can't store that energy for more than just even a few minutes. So they're taken over to the Kelvin cycle, and plants use the energy from ATP and NADPH to build high energy carbohydrates that are able to be stored for a long time. So again, Calvin cycle in summary is using ATP and NADPH from the light dependent reactions to produce high energy sugars. So I don't know how many times I've said that, but you hopefully are getting the point that this is an important point. So the Kelvin cycle does not require light. So the sunlight is only being gathered by the photosystems in the light-dependent reactions. So the Kelvin cycles used to be called the light-independent reactions or even the dark reactions. But we don't call them that anymore because they can occur if there's light out. It's just that they don't need the light at all. The light is being used by the photosystems. But in the Calvin cycle, we're going to be using the results of the photosystems. We're using the ATP and NADPH. So the Calvin cycle, you don't have to know every single part of it. But basically, um, just so you know how it works, um, it actually is a cycle. So we have CO2 being absorbed by the plant. So we exhale it. Living organisms exhale the carbon dioxide. The plants actually allow it to diffuse into their um, leaves, and then it enters this cycle. And what it does is it combines with a 5-carbon sugar to make a 6-carbon sugar. So we take the carbon off of the CO2 and put that carbon right onto this 5-carbon sugar. So now we have a 6-carbon sugar. That 6-carbon sugar actually immediately breaks into uh, two 3-carbon sugars. 
So the result is when we have six CO2s being added, remember we get that six from our formula of six CO2 plus how much water? 6H2O gives us one glucose and six O2s. Now where are those O2s coming from? Well they came from um, actually the light dependent reactions. Remember when we split water we had oxygen coming off. So here the oxygens are actually being used within this um, cycle. So they're not actually the oxygens that we breathe. But the carbon dioxide, again, is an important part of this cycle. Now we have these three carbon sugars that have been made by adding the carbon to the five carbon here. And they actually go through a series of reactions um, to get to a point where they're actually something that can be used to make sugar. So this one actually, that uh, in a storage sugar and actually like glucose. Um, so in order to do that though, each time there's a reaction, we need to have ATP and NADPH's energy in order to make that reaction go. And so in order to get through this cycle, that's why we're using these ATPs and NADPH's because they're actually the um, energy that makes the reactions move along this cycle. So we finally get to a point where um, we get a three carbon sugar that's called 3GP and that molecule is what we then use um, or that the plant uses to make the storage molecules. It can make starch, it can make glucose, it just depends on the plant and that's why some plants may um, taste different than others because they have different carbohydrates that they have actually made from their Calvin cycle. But they all start with, with this basic three carbon right here. We just have to combine two of the three carbons to get glucose, for example. So we actually, when we do the math of this, and again, we're not going to test you on the math of this at this point, but if we have six carbon dioxides entering, we end up again um, combining with six of these five carbon molecules, and then they split up so that we end up with 12 three carbons here. And then we have 12 three carbons, and then all, as we go along the cycle, we end up here with 10. So what that's telling you is that we actually get two of these car three carbons coming off when we add six carbon dioxides. And the reason we do that again is to balance our formula of in order to get one C6H12O6, which is sugar, we need a six carbon sugar, so we need two of these three carbons. And so our six carbons actually ended up coming from here. So the two sets of photosynthetic reactions work together. The light dependent reactions are trapping sunlight energy in its chemical form and the light independent reactions are using that chemical energy to produce a stable high energy sugar that can be used for storage or for nutrition for a heterotroph. And they're doing that using carbon dioxide and water. Now there are many factors that are going to affect how fast photosynthesis occurs or if it's occurring at all. So think of, um, before I even talk about them, I want you to think about what those might be. And we're actually going to do a lab this week on um, different factors that might affect photosynthesis. So you're going to actually measure the rate of photosynthesis and then you're going to try and determine what might change that rate of photosynthesis. So think about what's happening with photosynthesis and all the different steps. And I'm going to end here. Um, well, actually, I'm going to speed right through it um, because I want you to think about um, what those different factors could be. Um, but 
I am going to end actually with the quiz again. So this is just some sample questions of things that you should be familiar with. So in plants, photosynthesis takes place inside. <clears throat> in general, the answer is going to be inside the chloroplast. Now, if it had asked you where is the light-dependent reaction occurring, you would have said in either A, the thylakoid, you could also almost say it's happening inside chlorophyll. Um, so it's not asking you about light-dependent reactions. It's just saying, in general, where is photosynthesis occurring? So that's the two different parts together, and that's inside the chloroplast. Now, energy to make ATP in the chloroplast comes most directly from... Well, we know it's not transfer of a phosphate from ADP, so it's not B. You know, it's not D, electrons transferred directly from NADPH. Those electrons are going to the Kelvin cycle. But the ATP is actually going to be made from the hydrogen ions flowing through the enzyme in the thylakoid membrane. So you might be wondering, why is C not a good answer? Because the electrons moving through the electron transport chain actually help build up the concentration of hydrogen ions. So they are indirectly involved in the making of ATP. But the actual physical making of ATP is only occurring as hydrogen ions th flow through ATP synthase, which is the enzyme located in the membrane. Okay, NADPH is produced in light-dependent reactions and carries energy in the form of, you should know this pretty easily, high-energy electrons. Another name for the Kelvin cycle is you should be choosing B. And which of the following factors does not directly affect photosynthesis? And we're going to have to pick A for that one, because wind doesn't really affect it directly. It's not a part of photosynthesis, but we know that water is required. We know that temperature is always going to affect how the proteins and enzymes work. Um, so how well the reactions work is going to be affected by temperature. And how much light you have is obviously going to affect your photosynthesis. And that's it. Hopefully this will help you guys be prepared for your quiz and um, understand your Chapter 8.